which uh, for uh, for those of you who don't know, Labor Notes is a uh, publication and education organization project that uh, works with rank and file union members to build more uh, democratic, transparent, and militant unions. Uh, as part of my work at Labor Notes, I work with uh, higher ed workers, uh, campus workers, and uh, sort of help to facilitate a group uh, called FEW. Uh, public Higher Education Workers, which meets once a week. Um, everybody is welcome. And we talk about uh, how we can transform our unions uh, to be more democratic and more militant, uh, the complexities of organizing on campus, uh, and help each other think and talk about how to do that more effectively. And out of those few meetings, um, some years back, uh, one of the conversations that we kept kept returning to was the way that campus debt was impacting uh, the the ways that the, what we were being told about what was possible on our campuses. Uh, the campus debt was driving a narrative about austerity uh, and and the cutbacks that were being demanded of workers, and so some number of us began, we talked about that a lot in the public higher education workers calls. Uh, but then some number of us were like, let's, we should actually get together and start focusing specifically on this. There's, there's, there's meat on this bone that we need to understand. And we need to understand how it's driving what we're experiencing on our campuses. And we need to do that in order to be able to more effectively organize against it. Um, and so that's how it came to be that there is now uh, the coalition against campus debt. And uh, I'll invite those who are in the coalition uh, to like raise your hand and be sure to introduce yourselves on chat as everyone's going to introduce themselves. Um, and and so our, this group, we've just called ourselves the debt group uh, to ourselves has been meeting uh, and, and working together to sort of pull apart what's actually happening on our campuses, as I said, with the goal of uh, hoping that we can better organize against it. And in fact, one of the things that we've discovered is that the very act of researching debt on our campuses uh, and doing that uh, with others on campus, with, with the union, with other campus workers, itself has become an organizing activity. It's a way that we bring people into the conversation is exploring how debt is operating on our campuses. Um, but more than that, we've also organized around debt reveal days uh, where we invite campuses, and some of you here have been a part of that, to explore the ways that institutional debt and the financiers who that brings onto campus uh, are, are deforming uh, the work of public education uh, and pushing a narrative, that, a narrative that's defunding it and, and in fact defunding it materially. Uh, so as part of that, we had uh, debt reveal days. The first debt reveal day was in April of 2021, where more than 30, 30, campuses, 30 campuses gathered to share what uh, they had done in terms of how debt was driving campus decisions um, and use that as, an, as a way to bring more people into understanding how, what, why this is a problem and how we can start to organize against it. Last year here in Massachusetts, where I'm based, we had a statewide campus reveal day uh, because we've been able to, uh, with the support of the leadership of the Mass Teachers Association, really build uh, some deep connections and understandings about how debt is a driving force in undermining public higher education. Uh, so we're here tonight to uh, talk about the book, uh, Bankers uh, in the Ivory Tower, which is sort of one angle, one into understanding what's happening on campus. The thing we wanna say about that is that as we're talking about that, we, we are always, sort of wanting to develop our analysis uh, so that we understand what we're up against. But, but, but we want to do that 
not to just say we understand it, but to say, okay, what does this teach us about uh, how we can organize against it? How can we begin to under, understand our enemy so that we can more effectively fight our enemy? Uh, so welcome uh, tonight. Delighted y'all are here. Um, I don't know if, uh, Rich, if you had a chance to post the link uh, for uh, the Coalition Against Campus Debt. Um, I'll... I did. I'll post it again in case people Great. find it late. Great. Cool. Um, so with that, it looks like folks have introduced themselves on uh, chat, and I'm going to pass things over to uh, Sophia, who's going to sort of give us an overview of what's in the book. Some of you may have read the book. Some of you may not have read the book. I'm a former high school English teacher. I'm always scared to ask who did the reading. Uh, I learned that sometimes it was good to have some people who had done the reading, uh, but we could often find our way to a good conversation if we hadn't. So uh, Sophia is going to give us a, an overview, and then we're going to just jump into conversations uh, about what we're what uh, Charlie Eaton has to say, how that compares to some of what we've been thinking about and what we can do about it. So, Sophia. Thanks, Barbara, and thanks for everyone who showed up on a Tuesday night to talk about debt. Um, so yes, uh, Rich and I actually worked together to pull out some kind of thought-provoking major threads um, in the book. So if you had a chance to read it, you know, refresh your memory if you haven't, um, maybe it'll be generative for our discussion. So I did uh, put together a few slides that I'm going to share. Um, give me a second to do that. And um, I'll go through them and then we'll, it will not take very long. And then we'll really um, open it up for a conversation about the book, but also about how, what do we do with this type of analysis? Do we agree, disagree? And um, how do we organize to fight campus debt? Um, so one of the things that the book does is like we're, especially those of us in public higher ed, which is probably most of us in this room, we're so very familiar with uh, the story of the decline in state funding to our public higher ed um, institutions, right? We talk about it, uh, we organize around it. Um, and Charlie Eden adds like additional dimensions to that story um, and traces like what else is happening at the same time as public higher ed is getting defunded. And so some of the things he points out that Rich and I thought were useful are that, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you also have attacks on unions and working class standards of living um, that drive demand for higher education. So he even says like higher education becomes kind of a social welfare program. So like so many folks in the US um, turn to higher education as their only hope to in increase their uh, standard of living given, you know, just com complete erosion and exacerbation of inequality. And at the same time that that's happening, you have a coalition of business forces and other conservative forces that are bipartisan um, that are um, getting rid of financial regulations and um, undermining public higher education as a public good. And so you, you have an increased stability by the wealthy, by specifically uh, financiers to avoid taxes um, and usurp government subsidies for students. Um, and this leads to increased inequality and uh, shortages in higher ed funding. So it's not just like a decline in state funding, but these other things are happening at the same time. Um, so to talk more about the financialization aspect of the story, um, he traces the financial deregulation that occurred starting in the 70s and 80s um, at, and the growing power and centrality of financial markets. So as things become more deregulated, these are additional ways that wealthy elites can uh, make money. And um, the kind of the profit-driven imperatives become normalized across all, not just corporation, not just the corporate world, but like across the board, including in higher 
higher education. And part of the argument that he makes is that this happens through the personal social networks of these wealthy elites who like almost all of them go to these very few, very elite um, Ivy League institutions where they're all connected to each other um, and they leverage those social ties to like make all kinds of deals and find out all kinds of information that allow them to build, to build wealth. Um, and so the financial logic comes to dominate institutions that are technically nonprofit, like the places that we, uh, where we work. Um, money should always be allocated where it will yield the highest rates of return. And the uni university leaders, leaders of our universities, uh, no exception in also following that imperative. Um, all right, so what do these financiers do? Um, just very concretely, like what happens um, and what are they doing in our industry, <laughs> the industry of higher education? So they're involved in lending to students, student loans. They manage endowment investments. Not all of our uh, employers have endowments, but some do. Um, they buy and manage for-profit colleges, which matters a lot to us, even if we don't work at those colleges. And I'll say a little bit about why that matters. And they sell bonds to universities. And we've, in our work, uh, focused on the other debt crisis. We've really focused on that last part, right? Uh, the capital debt that our universities acquire and the role of these actors and um, um, profiting from that debt. Right, so I said about their social ties um, and as the state funding decline, colleges turn towards financial markets for resources. So they borrow money to, you know, just um, it, as part of normal campus operations, repairing and building, building a dorm and so on. Um, so these are some of their interventions that drive increased inequality in, in, in higher ed, but also in the US as a whole. So there was, in the 1990s, like uh, there was a drastic exp expansion of federal student loans. So not expansion of grants money, but grants kind of frozen, but it's expansion of student loans, like dramatic. And what I learned from this book, which I didn't realize before, is that that was actually pushed through by bankers, like huge um, bank corporations, um, and because they profited from, from these loans in the 90s. Um, then these uh, hedge fund managers and pri private equity, um, I wanna say leaders, there's probably a more technical name for them. Um, they turned to their fancy Ivy League schools to actually, um, finance their ventures. So they used these college endowments and they were connected to these colleges as alums, sometimes often actually for many generations, um, to, uh, as you, to use to invest in their private equity and in their hedge funds. And when you do that, you're also, it helps with not paying taxes, right? Because these Elite colleges are nonprofits, <laughs> um, and you know, it, aside from having a lot of money um, to invest in what they were doing, they were also avoiding paying um, taxes and undermining government funding of public higher education and education in general, public education in in the states that these elite colleges were located in, and they were also buying up for-profit colleges. So they were diverting federal student loan money to these for-profit colleges that, as most of us know, do not really uh, serve the students. They just put them into debt and don't provide education or the credential that actually helps them with social mobility. So they're diverting the government funding through public subsidies for for-profit colleges. So the two ways of looking at it is that Government subsidies start to flow not to public higher ed, but to colleges that either exclude the less advantaged students, so the elite colleges, or that exploit the less advantaged students, the for-profits.
uh, here is where we put too much stuff on one slide. Um, so to talk through the three tiers, uh, so in this book, he uh, analyzes the effect on three types of colleges. So you have the elite privates, right? The Harvards and so on, Stanford's. They're, you know, they're hoarding their endowments and their endowments like explode, uh, huge endowments. And they serve, this doesn't cause them to serve more students, right? They continue to serve a very small number of students who are overwhelmingly advantaged. And that's the last bastion of debt-free college that we have in the US because increasingly they don't, um, if they have students who um, have financial need, they give them grants instead of loans. Um, but that serves very, very few students. Then in the middle, we have public universities. Um, you have the tax and subsidy diversions that go to elites and to for profit. So in the middle, you have, you have to get the money somehow, right? So you increase student borrowing. So student debt is financing it. And you increase capital borrowing, right? The university is borrowing money for buildings and such. And because of this, you know, uh, increased involvement by these financial actors, you have whatever semblance of democracy that might have been in terms of making decisions or the uh, some kind of state oversight of decision making in these institutions really gets eroded. Um, there's less public oversight um, in what happens. They still are unable to meet the demand, right? So at this time, we can talk about what happens in recent years, but when he, the time he's describing, there's like still a lot of demand for higher public, ed public education and this demand is not met fully um, by this. He also describes that, you know, these are still public institutions and it's not that they are privatized explicitly, but the principles by which they come to be run really show that they have become commercialized. So there's a shift in the nature of how they run. Um, and Rich noted um, this, this will be of interest to many of us in these fields, but it also comes with the pressure to cut humanities and social sciences and, uh, and so on. And then you have finally have the for-profit colleges where the private equity investors acquire these colleges in order to capture tuition revenue from expanded loan programs. And for students, this generates crushing debt, you know, few, if any, economic benefits, and it is preying on already the most disadvantaged college students that we have. Um, so what to do about all this? Um, in his last chapter, Eaton goes through um, kind of two scenarios for social change. And um, I think these, um, these are thought provoking, but there's probably a lot that we can talk about in terms of whether we agree with these approaches or this analysis and what else uh, might be on the table. So he's focused on the, um, what happened in California with the successful passage of millionaires tax and um, more recently, we had the big win in Massachusetts with that as well. But basically, he describes um, a slower, more incremental method of social change where social, uh, like people that are fighting, you know, the situation in higher ed and the debt specifically, actually bargaining with bankers and using some of these bankers' uh, social ties to like the more elite public institutions, like some of them went to Berkeley. And so they're like proud of being Berkeley grads or whatever. And uh, that helps according to Eaton um, to, I don't know, appeal to their sense of fairness and morality and get them to tax themselves <laughs> uh, and tax the wealthy. Um, and then there is um, then another scenario that he just describes is what he calls the big bang. Uh, so where you, uh, you you don't try to work with bankers, but you try to get more immediate results by like resetting the rules of finance um, through bottom-up organizing. You have just kind of grassroots pressure building from below rather than um, negotiating with the elites. And the example that he gives for that is the work of the debt collective. Um, 
and the movement to cancel student debt and to have free college for all, which you know um, has had some wins in some sectors of the industry. Um, so we came up with some discussion questions. Um, I'll stop sharing and we'll, we can put them in the chat. And I will turn to Rich and Tracy uh, to start us on our Q&A or our discussion, I would say. So what we we're hoping to do, you got a very quick look at those questions. Um, we're just trying to use those as a guide to have as much open discussion as possible. We don't have to follow these questions. And you know, we really think it's imperative for people to be talking to each other and learning from each other, not for us to be talking most of the time. So whether you've read it or not, or bringing in your own personal experiences is what's gonna make this you know, a more fruitful experience. So the first question that we thought would get people talking is, what was the most surprising thing you read or heard about in the book? And how could you use that strategically or tactically in organizing? Oh, there's the question too. Somebody had to be surprised by something. Joanna, you're surprised but muted. You're still, we still can't hear you. You turned off the mute, but we can't hear you. Okay, so. Dan's got his hand up. Okay, Dan, until Joanna gets back. Uh, I hope I'm not too long-winded. Um, I, I think the usefulness of this book to me, I, I still don't know the full usefulness because it's sort of, whenever I read it or think about it, it completely changes my perspective and then changes it back again as to what exactly financiers are. You know, are they vampires? You know, they're just there to extract, extract, extract for their own benefit and that's it. And it doesn't really matter if it's education or shoes or clothes or food, you know, are, is that what they are? Or have they been so successful to turn the public into the private and then to commercialize that private good that they're now who you have to negotiate with and who has power rather than the state. Because when it comes to debt, in the end, like what are the two ways to get rid of that debt? Do you pass laws to do it? Or do you strike and force the banks to concede on some demands? And that's second part is the thing that's kind of blowing up my mind right now, because I don't know what that means. And I don't know the mechanisms of if you refuse to pay for pay back your debts, like in some sense, the state comes in and acts like the police officers for the bankers, right? So like the strategy, so I guess the strategy is, do you go after government to try to change them into being good cops or do you do the power struggle directly with bankers and financiers? That's the big questions that I'm thinking about. Anyone else on that as follow up? Or back to Joanna. You're still on, now you're officially on mute. You have to unmute yourself. I'm now. really on mute. Now, now you're, now you're, you're yeah, yeah. off mute and we can hear you both. So the question uh, may be surprising or also just a question that raises um, that, that was raised for me in reading the book was, you know, this notion of debt free college and, you know, talking about um, how in the privates it's debt free because, right, the the wealthier tuition paying students are subsidizing those who can't. 
And then that's not usually how we think of debt-free college, right? We're thinking about it, um, in, in, at least in public colleges, as the taxpayers across you know, a state or through federal taxes are paying for the t- tuition for the, those who can't afford it. And the author, um, you know, kind of up, talks about the University of California system as being ideal because, listen, they are, you know, they're attracted. They have such a great product. <laughs> they can charge a lot and, and that allows them to have a debt-free system. So I, w- I was a little bit surprised with that kind of framing. And I hope, I don't think that's what we want to fight for at least for the the middle public state universities. Anyone else? Follow up or separate thing that surprised you? Uh, Sophia? Um, I think it's really important what Joanna uh, pointed out as um, the idea that you know, public higher ed is paid for by taxpayer. I thought what was useful in this book is how he shows the way that the elites have taken themselves out of the taxpayer through just like all of these ways of not paying taxes and all these loopholes of all kinds of, you know, not just the ones that I mentioned in the, in, in the PowerPoint, but uh, like they are essentially not the public at all. They're, they're not paying at all into it. Let me just add one of my own because as I've gone through this debt project, I've been astounded approximately 11,814 times about what's going on. I mean, we discovered covenants um, and um, intercept clauses where if a university cannot pay the debt, the debtors get to intercept the state appropriation and use it before it can be uh, used for educational purposes. And you know, the first time I read that, I just said, that really can't be true, except that it is. Um, and similarly, when we were discovering that again at Salem State, the average debt per student was $3,300 a year just for capital debt. It was like, is this true? Yes, it is. Um, Salem State was actually bragging about it because it showed how they could leverage their students to guarantee the debts would be paid. They had no concept that this would be offensive to students and higher ed workers. And what keeps getting me is the minuscule stuff. Uh, Sophia had mentioned, you know, the way it de-democratizes um, public higher ed. Universities have to compete for good credit ratings. And the credit ratings are based on, among other things, who's on your board. The more financiers, the higher the credit rating. The more educators, the lower the credit rating. The more tenure and the stronger the union, the lower the credit rating. But then there was another one that I found in the book about um, investment disclosure requirements, that public universities are required to be transparent. And um, the private hedge funds demanded that the University of Michigan be exempted from disclosure because if the University of Michigan invested publicly, then that hedge fund's trade secrets would be out in the open. So they demanded and got Michigan to eliminate the transparency requirement for Michigan's investments. And that's just another one of these invisible unless you know to look for it, processes in which things are taken out of the public sphere. Uh, Kendall? I think Jason was in front of oh, me. Sorry. So I'll, I'll let him go for this. You can go, go ahead. Go ahead, Kendall. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I just I wanted to quickly follow up on the debt covenant thing. Uh, Tracy, who is here, had brought to my attention once that 
uh, I'm in Colorado and there had been a state law change in the early 2000s that allowed uh, public universities here to, uh, you know, the amount of tuition that you're allowed to pledge to, to Wall Street increased from 10%. That was kind of the norm in the early 2000s to now 100%. So at my university now, <laughs> when you look at these uh, bond offering statements and these and these covenants, like they're allowed to pledge 100% of tuition, all of our fees, right, which is interesting, because that's like one of our big campaigns, we're trying to get rid of fees. Uh, and yeah, that 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 is shocking to me as well. And something I didn't know until Tracy gave that presentation. But I guess my, my question uh, now would be besides that, which is clearly an area of organizing, because that's pressure we can put on our, our legislators. Uh, when we're going through these documents, which I think for a lot of us are difficult uh, to, to look through, like what else in there like that uh, might we want to look for, right? That's it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to that real quick. So CU Boulder, our union, UCW Colorado recently won um, a victory to get rid of some student graduate student fees. And CU Boulder had to then re, they had to rewrite the covenants of all of their bonds. And uh, so everything had to get rewritten because all of their bond covenants said that student fees were um, part of that. So it's interesting to think about like this part of our activism or a part of our organizing that we thought had nothing at all to do with the bond part of it came back and then had this big impact and probably cost the university $15 million or something in, in bond refinancing fees. Jason? Yeah, so this is all super striking. And I, I, I think this addresses some of the points that Dan started to bring up and then others highlighted as well. But I guess my question is like, and this is through studying with you all as well, there seems to be a problem of like governing by debt. And what I mean by that is that it's not the board of trustees necessarily, it's not the president of the university, it's not your department chair, but it's like financial capitalists that are governing your university in a lot of different ways. And I think that's hard to grapple with because I think we spend a lot of our time going after the department chair, going after the president and these other characters, when in fact, there's like this financial capitalist system run by these people that is like setting the stage for what happens or not, which I think poses an enormously difficult question of like, who do you target then? And I guess what I was surprised about in the book, and I think this is, worth talking about further is that he spends a lot of time talking about these individual players who like pull the strings but i can't help but think that if you removed some of these individual players that are pulling the strings and we, let's say we had successful campaigns against them they would just be replaced by some other guys which means that in a sense like some of the targeting goes beyond the individual and so his move at the end of the book, which I thought was the right move, and I think Massachusetts just proved this as well, which is to say, like, you have to, like, target the debt economy insofar as you have to flip, like, where our financing is coming from. And I'm not, I'm not sure if, if it's a both and issue or an either or where, like, you either you go after these individuals that he, like, talks incessantly about or you just say, you know what, it doesn't matter who the individuals are, let's just go after the system itself and try and reverse where we get our funding from. And so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But I, I was a little surprised by the, the direction that the book took. And so far as like, there's this enormous amount of detail about these individual players and how they're friends and they're mainly dudes from Ivy League schools and all this other stuff, right? That's not surprising. But then at the end of the book, he shifts towards this other thing that they that Sophie and Rich highlighted, right? Which is where you have these like these different campaigns, which to me are more structural. Um, so it'd be really interesting to hear what other people have to say about some of this stuff. Can I just usurp my chair position in case people don't know what folks are referring to about Massachusetts um, last week? Uh, Massachusetts passed the Fair Share Amendment, which increased taxes on individual incomes over a million dollars from nine to from four. I'm sorry, I can do this from five to nine percent, um, and specified 
that that increase in state income estimated to be 1.2 to 2 billion a year could only go for public transportation and public education subject to appropriation. So it was a restructuring of the rules. Um, and that did pass. Um, the Mass Teachers Association was probably the largest force behind that. And part of that has to do with the long-term growth of the Progressive Caucus Educators for Democratic Union in that over the past 10 years. So that's a different type of edu of organizing strategy as well. Other folks? Barbara's yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about Dan's question and 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 uh, your follow up with that, Jason. And um, I, I I haven't read the book, but I was surprised in Sophia's presentation by how personal it sounded. Like I could hear that that he was sort of talking about these individuals, um, and I found that that interesting. I I guess that thinking as an organizer, um, I, I think what we do is we target individuals and then we and then we do political education at the same time. And that, that I think that's always tricky that the people can come to think it like it's a moral issue. It's just a bad individual. Uh, you know, like my answer to your question, Dan, is like they're vampires. That's the short answer. They're vampires. Um, uh, but there's a whole system of vampires that support each other because <laughs> the system is built that way. And so how do we, like I think for organizing, we want to target individuals because it makes it more visceral for people and more immediate and understandable. But we have to be really careful that we don't think we don't slip into sort of the neo, the liberal frame that would suggest that it's just bad people, but that in fact it is a it is a bad system, and that's where I think these analyses can be really important, in uh, so that it's so that it's not like just the Massachusetts state system is fucked up, but like there's a there's something bigger beyond that, and we have to figure out how to do both of those at the same time. Uh, have a target that's like an immediate target but be doing political education to the broader target. And I, 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 those are easy words to say. I'm not pretending that's an easy thing to do. But when you do well at some point, somebody says, it's fucking capitalism. And then you're like, yes, they figured it out. Joanne was pointing out in the chat that, um there are other kinds of for-profit privatization schemes like outsourcing, student housing, um, online education. Many There are many companies that, that do, for instance, dorm residential living um, and, and food services. Um, and these financial agreements are not available in public records. So as much as we can find out through these financial documents and the bond covenants, there's so much more that we can't, we aren't seeing unless we utilize the power for public universities, at least to figure out how to do mass open records requests. Like, is that a part, I, I guess I'm asking a question, like, is that part of how we use this information to do organizing or is where, what direction, that's part of the original question that, um, that, that Rich was trying to ask before but what's the direction that we're taking with organizing based on the like looking at this information? Can I ask a follow up question to Rich and the Massachusetts people? I'm just curious. Did it matter in Massachusetts if you even knew the names of any of the financial capitalists that were responsible for pulling off some of these debt agreements? Succinctly, no. So then, 
What does that mean? <laughs> to the extent that there was negotiations, it was more negotiations with those representatives um, on campus. In other words, there were negotiations to push the presidents of public universities who did not instinctively or logically take the position of being pro-public funding. It took a lot of effort to get even them. But I am not aware, and I was not part of the Mass Teachers Association or the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition, whether they were actually um, negotiating and trying to get anybody from the financier side to endorse this. I did not, to my knowledge, see any evidence of it. What I did see the day afterwards was a very, for lack of another word, bizarre article in the New, in the Boston Globe about how this easily could have been defeated if only big financiers cared enough to do it. But they couldn't get their asses in gear. And they buried the, the lead because they said they didn't want to be identified with being that greedy. And they never asked, why did they fear that? But I, to my knowledge, and like I said, I was not in those negotiations, there were not the same types of negotiations that were outlined individualistically um, with individuals in California. I think if I can just say, I think that's a really interesting question, Jason. In terms of the millionaire's tax in Massachusetts, we did say to people on the doors, there are six people in Massachusetts who have put the money in to destroy this. And we had a number six. And sometimes we would say Bob Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots. And guess what? He gets the roads. He gets public roads that drive that people drive to get to his stadium that he makes money from. So like there was some capacity to do that. But I, the other piece of this, and in terms of Rich's answer, having sat on the Raise Up Massachusetts committee back when I was president of the MTA, Raise Up Massachusetts was split as to how much they saw this as a negotiating tool and how much we saw it as a big bang, let's blow up the truth of what's happening here. And those are ongoing debates since the Fair Share Amendment seven years ago was first put out there, was let's bring the business people in, let's get the business people with us. Uh, and then those of us who are like, no, let's blow the whole thing up, let's show everybody what's actually happening here. And so it's a, it's an interesting piece in terms of why the analysis matters when you're going into organizing, because where's the real enemy? Is it just that we want softer capitalism? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just say that the uh, the victory party that didn't get to be a victory party until the next day, one of the uh, communications people for the Raise Up campaign uh, was like, you know, Barbara, I'm going, I'm going to the Boston Globe tomorrow. And I'm going to say, see, business has to sit down with Raise Up Massachusetts. That's the name of the coalition. And I was like, Steve, you're out of your fucking mind. Like, like, what we have to do is go to the Boston Globe and say, we had three e illegal strikes in Massachusetts this year. We're just getting started. Like, but that's the question that you, that's the question that you posed, Dan. Like, is it that we're going to sort of negotiate our way to something better? Or is it that we're going to demand something better and then figure out how to go and fight for it? I would posit that many of us for the Fair Share Amendment saw that as because it was a citizen's petition, was saying, we're not waiting on the legislators. We're doing this ourselves. Uh, but within the coalition, there's a battle about that. Emily, I saw your hand there for a second.
Emily, was that? Oh, okay, cool. Yay. Um, other folks want to follow up on this one? Or if not, the next question was basically, are there any clarifying questions or comments about the data or argument? Did the argument itself make sense? Or were there also you know, places in there that you might not have been familiar with all the workings of the financialization and commercialization? And we want to make sure that people have a chance to clarify it and not get lost in that type of stuff. Katie? So I had a couple questions. So one thing I didn't understand when you were going over it was about the loans and why those are like um, increasingly going to for-profit universities over state institutions. Is that because like the for-profit institutions are like the least selective and then the students with the most financial need, that's where they're getting in and going? Um, so that was one question. And I think the second question has somewhat been clarified, but like on the last slide about the, the millionaires tax, um, like, so from how Barbara made it sound and how I understood it before, it, it was like less about negotiating with financers and like appealing to their morality and more about like, you know, saying that millionaires should have to pay more. But I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how it went in California. I wasn't familiar with the 2012 California Millionaires. Um, I forget what it was called, Millionaires Tax or Millionaires Amendment. And was that one more about kind of like appealing to business to do what's good? I can take the first one. Um, so I think it what what you said about for profits is part of it, but it's there's also been just like a massive expansion of for profit colleges, like just more, much more enrollment. It was like an explosion of them. Um, so they're very lucrative because they're pretty inexpensive to run because you're not actually providing it very much. Um, and you can take student, student loans, right? And you make money off of the student loans. Um, and they, their recruitment strategies are, are targeting non-traditional disadvantaged students. Um, they also target uh, veterans. Um, so they, they have like a very uh, sophisticated marketing uh, campaigns that end up like tapping into student populations that maybe would not have gone to college. Um, but probably should have gone to public institutions in their state. So um, this kind of predatory inclusion is, is a term that you could use. Uh, you're including people in higher ed with this predatory practice that leaves them much worse off than they were. Um, I just wanted to add to that, that they're, the way that for-profit um, higher ed tends to work is there's a federal standard where I think only up to 90% of revenues can come from um, from federal loan programs, if that's, I'm, I might be paraphrasing that incorrectly, but it's some huge percentage can come from them. And so they can target specifically looking they're looking for people who will qualify for loans so that they can take loans and then they encourage them in the financial aid process to apply for and accept as many loans as possible um because that they're guaranteed by the government and i'm yes lower ed is a fantastic book um Does anybody, I, I just wanted to add one other thing, which is that what I found, again, one of those mini 
points that was shocking was it wasn't just the hedge funds that were investing in the for-profits, but it was the elite universities themselves. Um, so it's not even a blind eye and there's not always an intermediary. Um, sometimes it's just that directly mercenary. Um, I don't, is there anybody who has um, information about the millionaire's tax in California? I only know what I read. Guess we don't have an answer on that one, Katie. Sorry. I mean, I, I can say what he writes, but I like that is one account. And I mean, I'll, I'll read you a sentence that kind of encapsulates it. And he says, um, the bargaining strategy succeeded in California because the state's public universities weave an unusually broad and powerful network of intimate ties among civic leaders. So like he's still really emphasizing these social ties among these ind elite individuals as kind of the main mechanism, which is somewhat unsatisfying in my opinion. So the next question sort of gets back in a different way to Dan's question, the one we've been coming back and forth to, which is what theories of change are embedded in this book and how can we use that to think about creating change in public higher ed. Um, anyone? Um, I'll go. I mean, I. this might be just the politics professor in me, but um, I, I think the interesting thing is like, whether or not you see the different entities that are in play in all, every financial transaction, like every point of transaction, right? As a point of political resistance or like in a Gramscian framing, like a, um, a coalition, I forget what he calls coalitions. Um, you know, so you get these coalition, you know, is it possible to get a coalition of everybody up the chain of finance? And when, uh, in order to have enough power to tell bankers, we're not going to have the system anymore. Though I don't know if it's just bankers, is it bankers, is it capitalists? of every stripe you know that's the other issue is like if you go after the financiers there's all the other people who are interested in capital in the other industries and whether or not they're going to try to um yeah i'm just having a big marxist word salad in my brain right now i i, I think the main point is that there's i i don't know who the allies are in terms of trying to figure out like who can you get on your side when the argument completely changed their perspective on how economic relations are set up like how can you get that into a position of power that can then help you win more people within a governing space or in society to agree with you i i don't know but how do you get that but that's the thing is like, who, I mean, is it like a a battlefield where you can just take over space, right? You take over this union or this industry, and then you have more leverage to take over other industries with these ideologies, or is it, I, I mean, that's the only kind of conception I have, and that might be completely the wrong way to understand how we, what the battlefield is that we we face. Anyone else want to jump in on that? I'm trying not to talk too much, but I'm being unsuccessful. Um, so yeah, what Joanna said. Um, 
is part of it. I, I you know, to my comment, like one of the things I was thinking is that you know this whole the Jason I were just saying Jason saying like the millionaires tax open up a lot of space. I think the space that that opens up is a space for like we don't just name how bad things are. We we contrast the way things are with the ways things might be. And like part of what the win in the millionaires tax does is it, it reintroduces the public good in our, not just in our imaginations, but in like people are over the next three to five years are going to have more well-funded schools. Our roads and bridges are going to get fixed. They're not going to be able to tell us that there's no money when we go looking for for money for public transportation. And so it, it changes the way people know themselves in the world in terms of what's possible. And that piss, that will make them more angry about what isn't possible. Like we, we need to sort of do both of those things at the same time. And I, I don't think it has anything to do with persuading the people who currently have power. It, it's only about forcing their hand and figuring out where are the places we can force their hand. And some of those are going to be small places that we force their hand. But the more we do that, the, the, the more of the battlefield will have won uh, until they, they control less and less of it. And I, again, like those are easy words to say, but I don't, and I don't know what Charlie Eden says, like the, what Sophia presented is interesting to me because he sort of presented like incrementalism or revolution. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's exactly what he presented, but, or if he's talking about revolution, but it has to be about power. They are all operating on about power. They're not operating based on anything else, but, but capital and power. I think Charlie Eaton is arguing for, I'm, I'm not sure it's as, as revolutionary as what you're saying, but it, he definitely is saying that the finance system and the way that financing of higher education works is just part of that. Um, but that the system of finance and the system of how it undergirds our entire society needs to change. So there's, there is that kind of note. I'm going to add one thing also, because Jason had thrown in about what the debt collective is do doing in the process of change. And this isn't necessarily what Charlie is talking about, but it's what we're talking about, which is that it is organizing bottom up and it's really slow. And Barbara was talking about contrasting the reality with the possible. When the debt collective started saying cancel student debt, it was silly. You know, that was naive, utopian, nowhere to be seen. Um, only st stupid people would talk about that. And it's become both successful in getting several billion dollars canceled, but also it's made it an actual political issue. And then linking it back to the other thing, Biden did a very mild-mannered version of this. And that's presently being stopped in the courts. And what that does is get you back to the structure, right? Even if Biden is a nice guy, highly dubious, um, there's a structure that's going to pull out multiple stops to stop this. And so every victory, even when it's stopped, is a really positive educational building block. And I think as we're doing this, we also have to have a time perspective you know, similar to the debt collective, they've been at it for 10 years or more, right? They're not at full victory, but they're a hell of a lot closer than they were. And as we look at the financialization, as Barbara said, we're gonna win a few small things here and there and they build. And when people keep hitting the same barriers, those barriers become clearer, what they are and they're not the individuals, they're the structure.
So I'm going to do two other things. Um, one is before we get to a question of what is the role of organized labor in breaking out of the cycle, I'm just going to ask if there are any students here who would like to say how you know, you've been affected by this or why you've been interested or drawn into doing this. Um, if nobody wants to speak, that's fine. But if any of the students do want to speak, that would be really good. Fair enough. So the other question was, you know, what's the role of organized labor and unions in doing in breaking out of this cycle of debt? People have been doing stuff on your campus or statewide and want to talk about that at all, that would be great. Erin? Hi, um, I sort of put stack, sorry. Uh, I'm at uh, Wayne State in uh, the School of Medicine. I'm a faculty member um, there and I'm a member of the AAUP AFT. I'm the steward for my department, which is family medicine. Um, we are starting to look at debt in our campus uh, in preparation for our contract negotiation um, in two years. And one of the reasons why we decided to do that, and we've actually talked to you all <laughs> before, various members of our union, um, is we, you know, really settled on our last contract in terms of raises, and we took a lot of concessions, um, even though there was all this COVID money, like we took no raises in the first year of the contract. And then promptly after we ratified our contract, uh, administration gave themselves a 2% raise. And we were sort of like, wait, where did that money come from? That's interesting, because we were told there's no money. So I think we sort of felt like we got... Um, I don't know, like we were underprepared. We were un, we hadn't done our research on like, what does the money at our university kind of look like? And, you know, what is money going to? And so we were just sort of like, I don't know why, but the, you know, the teams were said, we believe you that there's no money. And then that kind of put us in a bad bargaining position and we didn't get what I think we could have gotten. So we're trying to put ourselves in a more financially knowledgeable situation. And that involves, of course, like thinking about, debt and where money's going so that we can say, well, actually we know that you've taken out, you know, these loans or are using money in these ways. And we're arguing that you need to reallocate that money to faculty and staff re, uh, pay raises. Um, you need to reallocate that to reducing tuition. So we're trying to use that um, in our sort of preparation for bargaining for a contract to at least when they come to us and say, we can't afford that, that we really know their finances better. So I think in our union, we're, that's how we're thinking about it. Jason's on stack. Yeah, I think one of the arguments that we've been making is that debt is a labor issue and that therefore needs to be taken up by labor unions. And I'll just give you two examples of that. Um, going back to Aaron's point, if you look at Moody's and the way that Moody's does their credit ratings, one of the things they'll talk about is that universities that have more um, stronger unions, they will actually threaten the credit rating or they'll drop their credit rating. And then to give you another concrete example with the Chicago Teachers Union, when they were in negotiations for their contracts, a lot of the discussion was that if they won the discussion, then there was a threat that they would drop their credit ratings for the city and the district. And so again, this is just to show those are two like structural ways in which like labor and debt are tied together, but just on a more individual level, debt becomes a labor issue insofar as that the more debt we have, the longer we have to work. It also weakens us at bargaining table negotiations because if we're desperate for funds to pay our debts, then we're going to accept, you know, weaker contracts, perhaps just because we have to have something with because if we, you know, to not pay the debts, we're all screwed, right? So there's just an, a, a lot of different ways in which debt is a labor issue, um, and that debt is a gift to capital because it imposes work. Um, and so that I think, like, 
there's a lot to say about this question that you posed, Rich and, and Sophia, and I, I really appreciate that question because I think it's like the creditor-debtor relation, social relation is just as important as thinking through some of the, you know, the older relations around the capitalist and the worker type stuff. And I would just add that, you know, the way the campus debt filters through to the students, um, that that's a really good way to build an alliance between labor and students. And it's both makes sense in that it's an important alliance. And I'll use my favorite quote, which is, we found out that our trustees don't respect students. They just disrespect them less than they disrespect faculty. And they're slightly more prone to listen to them. But when students find out how much they're paying just for capital debt, they're pretty quick to make the linkage to how that affects their education and you know, can participate in that. And that's tactically really important too because to the extent that higher education workers are saying, you know, we want more funding, we will frequently be cast as greedy, money-grubbing folks. But to the extent that students are saying we need more money so that there's a decent education, it changes the framework qualitatively and it strengthens everybody's position. Um, so the labor unions are really critical but better as part of a coalition than alone, I would argue. And Sophia's on stack. Yeah, I agree with that, Rich, because actually I was thinking about Aaron's question and how, like, figuring out how to understand the stuff and how to get the data so that you could, you know, use it in with negotiating and uh, I mean, I think, unfortunately, what sometimes also happens is that like union leadership will use that type of information preemptively to like scale back labor demands because they're like, look, our institution is in debt. Like we can't ask for that. And it's not their fault. It's, you know, the fault of the state. <laughs> Uh, so you should tweet at your legislator and maybe that will change. Um, like I see that playing out in my own union where they're just, and it, ha it has everything to do like with what Jason said, like debt is a labor issue because, you know, there, there are layoffs and people are not being replaced and the remaining workers are having to carry all the extra work. Um, and the reason for that that's given is the debt of the institution. Right, so how do we do this research and organize around it? Does it feed into this kind of hopeless cycle where we we're just kind of retreat and retreat and and um, yeah? Daniel's on stack. I tried to. Um put into a concrete example what I was trying to talk about last time, which was gobbledygook. What I think Sophia points to, this is what I'm thinking, that if we want to challenge debt, not only do we have to have our members aligned to do so, we need to figure out how to align with students, and that's a huge project in and of itself, but to also successfully do a challenge that, at least at the university level, we have to convince management to be on our side as well, so that we can both challenge the banks directly, as well as try to get the state on our side, because we're a respected institution, right, of higher ed, get the state on our side. So when the bankers try to come down on us, they won't be able to, right? And that's a very heavy lift. And I I mean, this is kind of the beginnings of trying to do that, of like, how do you not only take over unions and ally yourself with students, 
but how do you control the means of production enough to convince management or take over management so that you can challenge this entire debt structure? I mean, because until management agrees that they should not be borrowing any more money and they need it to come from public sources, you know, we're still dead in the water. Management's going to respond when we have more power and make them more scared than the bankers make them scared. But at that that's, point, that's that's that, and that's not going about going to management. That's about disrupting everything around management. We have to we have to force them to a choice. Right, but it's better to have management and the state on your side than not on your side. I guess that's what I'm getting at. I. I think it I think we're looking and I'm sorry to interrupt about this, but right. I'm like I'm passionate about this. Like I don't know why we're looking up. I don't know why we're looking up for power. They they're they're not interested in us until we scare them. We don't see any struggle where they're where where the elite or those who have access to the elite, the chancellors and the presidents who were just going to be tossed out as fast as anybody, but who's who are offered more. Like it, we only, as Maureen says, we only scare them until when we we brought enough people on board. But I I I worry about the idea that we're going to convince them of something. Like I just think it it we, we we're we're looking the wrong way. We got we to gotta look, like people were saying, we got to look at each other. We got to look at students, got to look at communities, got to say, what do we actually want for ourselves? Um, we didn't win fair share because we went to the elite to win it. We had to fight tooth and nail to win that. Mm -hmm. so I, I just think, yeah, sorry. Lena's on stack. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll just, just jump in on that and reiterate, like I I come from a state where we don't have the benefit of the illusion that we could ever get, um, you know, management on our side to see sense. Um, our, our management was fairly placed by the governor's chief of staff who led our system for quite some years. And only once he had sort of stacked every management office at the highest level did he step away. Um, though he had no uh, um, you know, actual experience in higher ed. And I think more and more, whether you see it happen that way or not, that is kind of what's happening at the higher ends of, of public higher ed. It is very much a sort of um, political um, entity more than it is an education entity. And there, there is no room for persuasion. So what we have done is um, sort of joined together. So our unions have joined together with like 50 odd other um, unions and community groups. And we're going directly to um, ideally the streets and, and talk, we're talking about tax structure. We're talking about corporate tax. We're talking about those sorts of things. And it, it's gonna be a very long haul. I mean, our <laughs> governor's not at all, um, you know, susceptible to it, but it it is gonna be that kind of political fight, but it'll have to be, you know, outside of, outside of the walls of any of these institutions, including the governmental institutions. Any follow up on that? Can I'm I in Connecticut. What state? Connecticut. Okay, thank you. You could answer it orally instead of typing if it's easier, Kalina. 
<laughs> yeah, so our Barking for the Common Good um, effort is, um, it, it's called Recovery for All, and I don't know if you know, like, Norma um, from VCG, but she's kind of leading the effort here. So, yeah. And I think in, in, in conjunction with that also, we're attempting to push legislation that requires more hiring of full-time as opposed to adjunct um, labor. So, I mean, again, <laughs> long, long haul, but it's the attempt. I'm going to suggest one thing because we're sort of getting close to our time. Um, it's sort of a linkage back and then we're gonna ask Barbara to summarize for us. But um, as we're talking about the strategies and the larger parts, I do wanna push for people thinking about actually doing debt reveals, looking at your campus, seeing how much debt your campus has and how that affects the campus. Um, we've developed a worksheet that for many universities you can do in three to four hours. It will tell you how much per student um, they're paying, students are paying for capital debt. It will point that out as a percentage of the campus's budget. At Salem State, it's 10%. We found out at Wisconsin, it was like two plus, And somebody said, oh, no big deal, until it pointed out that that was the size of the entire College of Education budget. Um, you can use the worksheet and figure out if there were no debt, how many faculty positions could be expanded or maintained, how many classes could be expanded. And it's fairly simple process to do. And reading this book convinced me that what happens out of doing that is in fact that you get a lot of results that are both mobilizing but also very much in line with what Charlie Eaton's much more detailed in depth and academic research gets. You get a practical version of the same thing in much less time, and it can be very useful for organizing. And as somebody said, by having people do that research themselves, it's empowering and organizing rather than hiring somebody to come in and tell you what the debt is that's passive, it doesn't get you going. We've gotten um, you know, students involved because they've done the research on the campuses themselves and they've really been committed to that. Um, I would do one other plug if I might, which, and then I'll turn it over to Barbara, is that um, you know, the group that's doing this, the, um, I keep forgetting our name, um, the coalition for, who are we? We keep changing it. Coalition Anybody? Against Campus Debt. I Thank think. you. The Coalition for Campus Debt. Um, if anybody is interested in starting a campus debt review, go to the website and contact um, any of us. We'd be happy to give you links and help on that. Uh, Sophia put in a link to the most recent Nation article about it. Um, we are aiming for another debt reveal in um, April next year. We are working with people in New York, hi Mary, um, you know, in Florida, in Indiana, in Oregon. We'd love to be doing other states. We are asking or suggesting you keep your eye open because hopefully by the fall, there'll actually be a book that we're working on coming out about how to analyze and organize around debt. So um, there's a lot that's still going on that's trying to spread this around in the same way that the Debt Collective started with, or a similar way that the Debt Collective started with the student loan debt. So unless there's follow-up, let me turn it back to Barbara. Any last thoughts or comments from especially folks who maybe haven't had a chance to say anything? Questions that you're carrying with you or something you're trying to say? Go ahead, Mary, Good morning. Yeah. Um, so this 
just is so extremely depressing to me so, um, to listen to how deep it goes. But I really tonight got a little spark of optimism because like hearing Tracy talk about how when they attacked the fees, how suddenly then that because this is so complicated and there's so many threads that the capitalists have in this whole thing, that as soon as they started pulling the fee thread out, things came falling down, you know, and I'm hoping, you know, this is just my hope that this is this house of cards. And when we start attacking the structure, it's just going to come falling down. And that's, you know, I just, I got some hope tonight hearing in a way the complexity will be its, will be the problem, you know, will be the the downfall of this whole thing. So that's just kind of an overview of what I heard tonight. Thank you. Anyone else, last, last thoughts? Well, uh, and I hope you do and check out the webpage, uh, which can help you get through some of the uh, things numerical uh, that, that make sense here, because discovered that people are figuring out how to use this who would uh, don't feel like they understand finances. Uh, so any of us can figure it out. So I hope you'll all do that. Um, I, I just want to uh, you want to post the website again for the uh, for the demo yeah, reveal? I'm doing that now. Yeah. Um, um, like I get, Maureen, that it, it's overwhelming. I mean, capital is overwhelming. The power and violence of capital is just like breathtaking. Uh, and that's like just like one entry point where we, we see that and where it becomes, it gets close for both of, uh, those of us who are in higher ed or those of us who are carrying personal debt. Uh, for what other reason, because that's, that's, we are a debtor society. Um, and I guess I'd say like, an, like, that alone poses like an organizing challenge for us, which is where do we find a space that we can sort of maintain and sustain each other uh, in the long haul, uh, and, 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 and find hope in that. Um, where does, you know, to the questions that sort of been explicit and implicit tonight, like, like wh where does having the, what does having the analysis do for us? Like that's, that's the thing as organizers, like it's good. And, and I think as organizers coming out of higher ed in particular, who like to have good analyses, um, like what does it do for us as organizers to have a good analysis? And for me, I think it leads us to have to really think about power and how power operates. And we have to look at history and we look at how, how change has been able to happen relative to how workers have, have been able to amass and use their collective power. Uh, like that's where I go with this. And, 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 and so, and then how can our analysis not lead us to despair uh, or being overwhelmed, but lead us to a sense of what's possible. And for me, the answer to that is that, that I think most of us don't want the world that we currently have and that, we, that it matters. That's part of why it matters. Like when we're talking about higher ed, public higher ed, that part of our organizing has to be like, what would it be like if? You know, and that's what the unions, too much union leadership has failed us that way. But that can, that's labor's job too. Labor's job is to say, what would it be like if we had free public higher education that was premised on education as a liberatory practice? Let's get some union leaders elected who start to say that and organize around that's what we're fighting for and all the funding that we need to do that. Uh, so I, I, I think it's hard to tease out, but I think it's essential that we think about power. It's essential that we think about what do we want, not just what do we not want. 
and that will keep us going or keeps me going. That and meetings like this keep me going. Any other last questions, thoughts? Please check out the links. If you have not been a part of the Public Higher Education Workers Network and you want to be a part of it, drop me an email at barbara at labornotes.org and, um, and keep in touch. We good? Thank you all. Take care. Solidarity.